Uh, hi, all of you. Uh, very happy to have you on the panel. So I have uh, two uh, experts with us here, uh, Venkat and uh, Ruben, and I will quickly introduce both of them and then uh, set the context of this panel. Venkat uh, uh, is an IM Cal uh, alumni. I think for people uh, in India, Cal is Kolkata, which is one of the major cities. And he's worked with KPMG, Infosys, and Accenture. And uh, right now, he's an institutional advisor and consultant uh, based in the US. Welcome, uh, uh, Venkat. Thank you. And uh, Ruben uh, uh, is actually from Romania, but right now he's based in Geneva. He's the professor of energy commodities and international economics, economics at uh, Webster University in uh, Geneva. And he's actually written books and he's actually uh, acknowledged uh, energy policy expert. I think our topic is, uh, uh, you know, very complex. We had another panelist, Vinik Mittal, who's the chairman of Avada Group, uh, which is building around 15 gigawatt of energy. And I think he may join us anytime. So I'm hoping that uh, that happens as we speak. Uh, so the topic is extremely uh, vast. And I think uh, when... Uh, you know, Venkat, Ruben, and uh, Vinit, uh, we were chatting up uh, yesterday. Uh, Ruben said something very interesting. India is the next China. And uh, I actually, it's a very good thing, but I think many people would believe it doesn't happen literally and that it happens only from an economic and a growth perspective. But, you know, uh, to just set the context, I think when we talk about India's economic goals and global goals, in reality, we are actually talking about balancing internal and external goals of India as a, a nation because it's very large. It has a huge population. It's one of the fastest growing economies in the world. It has the you know third or the fourth largest army in the world. So you know we have all of this uh, that is there at the back of us. So in reality, this is more about you know how do we balance the probably the conflict or the contradiction uh, between the internal and the external goals, which then you know amplifies itself on the world stage. And the other clarity that all of us have is that for India to really attain its, uh, you know, superpower status or its, uh, you know, uh, role in the world stage, it needs to continue to grow at eight uh, percent plus GDP per annum continuously for the foreseeable future, and that's very, very critical for India uh, to get there. The other challenge that people do talk about is the class divide, how uh, post economic reforms. The growth has not been exactly equal. So, but that is again something that I think is a larger topic. Uh, so, for focus, what we have done is we have kept the whole thing very simple and straight. And on the the business and the trade and the uh, energy and the sustainability aspects of it, even trade, I think I would want to play it under a little bit because I know that there is a parallel panel on free trade. So, I think in this panel we largely will speak about uh, sustainability, energy, and uh, uh, related uh, areas. So I will first go to Venkat. Venkat had actually a, uh, interesting perspectives on consumption, how we need to look at the demand side, not necessarily the supply chain. So over to you, Venkat, and I think uh, uh, why don't you share your perspectives? Thank you, Xavier. Hello, Ruben, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good evening and good afternoon from those uh, all those who are joining from India. I am right in the U.S., so anyone joining from U.S., a very good morning to all of you. Well, Xavier, uh, I just want to definitely want to track back and uh, give some some meaning the way I see as to what might be India's goals. I'm sure there are several, depends on which which uh, aspect of uh, global engagement we may want to look at or which aspect of internal engagement we may look at. But at a very, very broad level, I think India needs to have more wealth available at its disposal, number one. And I'm sure that's for generic infrastructure built out and lots of other assets which may be helpful in serving the population. Uh, other important goal, I feel, is also some more money in the hands of people and a larger cross-section of people. So therefore, what I would uh, therefore qualify this growth as uh, definitely the linear growth that we all are totally familiar with. But I also would like to therefore uh, bring into this conversation the need for inclusive growth. Now, here's where I go back to some of the other policy discussion that happen around the world. And we all understand that right now, the best available model for whole world for economic growth is a market model. Uh, but increasingly, all of us also understand the market model will probably not 
allow inclusive growth. Now, why do I bring the market model here? Is in some part, the sustainability conversation is also linked to the market model. And if the market model is uh, creating a problem for inclusive growth, which is India's goals, which also could potentially be the reason why we probably have unsustainable growth. Maybe if you can do something about the market model, it could provide resolution to many other issues. But then uh, uh, whenever we have this conversation between sustainability and growth, uh, the conversation quickly moves to energy and sustainability of uh, energy sources. And we often get into this very complex and very vast discussions, and of course, rightfully so, about the sources that power the growth of the economy that we talk about. And obviously, when it comes to India, it's a, a very significant concern because we are one sixth of the global population. And therefore, whatever we do, whatever we consume will impact the world, whether we like it or not. So now the question is, how do we distribute energy? And therefore, we can get into this conversation about gas versus so on and so forth. But then once again, without getting into too much of details, a couple of points that I wish to share is, first of all, whether we go to fuel, which is uh, which is called maybe coal based or non coal based or petroleum based or gas, whatever that might be, they're all limited. Each of them may have a differential sustainability footprint, but they, at the end of the day, in, in, in the ultimate analysis, they are finite resources. Even as on date, if all the countries in the world were to depend on these resources, we know there's, there's going to be shortage. So therefore, the question is, will supply side offer that issue, number one. Second is, there are renewable energy resources. There is wind, there is solar, there is tidal, so on and so forth. But again, the question is, uh, they have their technical That's limitations. And those <coughs> limitations, will they offer a base reliable supply for sustaining the economic growth? That's another, another issue. Uh, and the final point that I would like to kind of introduce before we get into further discussions being, if there, there are, of course, certain uh, answers and solutions available on the supply side, si supply side, but should we also look at the demand side? And maybe there's a bigger play available on the demand side. And when I say demand side, it's just not consumption. It's also the basic operating model with which all of us grow, especially in the context of India. It may be good to visit as to how does India grow as an economic engine, all the more so in the context of Southeast Asian region. So let me pause there and let me get into the rest of the discussions. Yeah. Before I go to Ruben, uh, uh, let me just welcome Vineet. Uh, hi, Vineet. Uh, uh, Vineet is the chairman of Avada Group, which is looking to achieve uh, 15 gigawatt uh, by 2025. He's a social entrepreneur and uh, he uh, wants himself to be a champion of uh, climate action and uh, sustainable development. And I didn't introduce myself, I think, which I'll do because I was just waiting for the entire panel to be on the screen for me to do that. So my name is Xavier Prabhu, and I actually run a couple of things. One of it is India's leading full service uh, PR and communication firms. And I also consult a lot of companies on their India entry and go to market strategy. And right now I'm in the process of uh, incubating a startup. So that's uh, in essence uh, uh, me. So welcome Vineet. And we just started. So I'll just go to uh, uh, Ruben. Ruben, you had perspectives from your expertise, uh, and you were talking about India needing to balance. Can you just talk a little more about uh, what uh, your perspectives are? Yes. Well, I, t I will take from the idea which I expressed and you quoted is that India is next China. Uh, I strongly believe in the economic uh, potential uh, of India and talents of Indian people and only uh, the uh, way how India managed to become the world leading exporter of ICT services and in that sense it is uh, uh, leading uh, and China is uh, active in production of ICT goods and it tries to enter also to but, but uh, India is uh, uh, a leader. It it is uh, an example of uh, uh, far-sighted right strategy and uh, putting the means and and creating the uh, necessary research and development and science and technology environment, bringing people and and taking a, a very important niche 
in international trade in service, services as a leader. Now, uh, as an economy, uh, uh, India, of course, uh, uh, will become soon the second uh, economy maybe uh, of the world. And that implies uh, increase in productivity, increase in um, um, uh, volume of production and consumption. And as a result, uh, India is uh, constrained by the sustainability targets adopted at Paris uh, conference in 2016, whereby countries are, are trying to foresee a possibility of even achieving a zero emission by 2050. Now, uh, the uh, we are living in a real world that would be to me an ideal world, uh, but uh, it will impose a constraint on the use of energy resources by India while assuming its strategy of rapid economic growth, transformation of its economy and taking the uh, uh, very promising niches in the world uh, trade and investment. Uh, so, uh, as a result, I think uh, the um, I, I went through uh, after our uh, yesterday conversation uh, the uh, International Energy Agency India Energy Report, uh, where uh, the uh, stated policy scenario shows that the co all the coal today is seventy uh, percent of the uh, electricity. Um, uh, production uh, by 2040, uh, it will go down uh, to maybe 30 to 40 percent, uh, and uh, the share of renewables will uh, uh, consequently increase to uh, close that gap. And as uh, Venkat said, uh, I think in terms of energy uh, production. Uh, uh, India is living in a world of uh, having access uh, to different energy sources. The primary, uh, the most uh, uh, easy access is coal, but the coal is the target of the sustainability uh, plans of governments uh, to diminish. So the, the, the whole challenge is how to uh, decrease coal share and increase uh, the share of renewables. I think India has the technological capacity to uh, develop uh, nuclear, uh, it can develop further the hydro, uh, it can, of course, uh, 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 start using on a more massive scale uh, solar and wind energy. And for that, uh, I think India can have um, um, the, the plans to develop uh, production of solar panels and the country is in a geographic uh, situation where it can uh, benefit greatly from uh, solar energy. So I think uh, the uh, investment in terms of public-private uh, partnership, which will uh, uh, give to businesses incentives, uh, uh, trade incentives, uh, fiscal incentives, and financial incentives, uh, to invest in uh, production of uh, solar panels and uh, windmills and, and create this capacity of renewables energy production. I think this, uh, this will be a more active uh, poly industrial policies of Indian government on federal and state levels uh, would be important to develop these types of energy and uh, and ensure the transition towards more sustainable energy model while uh, uh, not compromising on the dynamics of economic development and growth. Yeah, so Vineet, uh, uh, coming to you, you were uh, a lot more optimistic and you said that in the next three years, you see India also uh, you know, balancing the, the current imbalance and the dominance of China so, and you are in the sector, right? You are already deeply involved in the sector. Can you just share your perspectives, uh, Vineet? Uh, uh, coming directly to your question, uh, thank you, uh, Xavier. Uh, uh, I think uh, now India has built a policy framework 
where they are incentivizing local manufacturing. What had happened in China is that they invested very heavily on skills, uh, IP, and uh, mega scale factories. What they did is fully integrated uh, each and every component being manufactured in the same park. Uh, uh, they uh, founded it. And uh, what they did is uh, the high energy consumption uh, uh, products like silicon and wafer, et cetera, they took it to the remote part of the country where with their uh, hydro projects, they were able to give the electricity at two cents. So having a very comprehensive strategy in place uh, in the forms of capital subsidy, lower interest rate, lower returns expectation, and on top of that, uh, talent acquisition and IP acquisition, China has literally become the world leader in manufacturing. And they are not uh, doing older technology. They are in the front of futuristic technology, which people talk about. Uh, they will put up a gigawatt scale. and. Uh, uh, now, India has realized that if we are going to do 300 plus gigawatt over the next 10 years, there is no point of us uh, importing glasses and uh, solar panel across the world. And uh, we should uh, become locally capable and competent. And uh, my sense is there will be 8 to 10 larger players who will be investing in this in a very big way. And in the next three years, we should uh, see them live. Some of them will go live uh, first with the cell to module and then wafer and then eventually silicon also. So we see that uh, India would benefit also in some way, like uh, what we benefited in telecom. Like in telecom, we didn't had even landline access to 50% of the country and we directly went Wi-Fi and wireless. So in India, what you will see is that many of our factories are not going through learning of multi-crystalline technology. We'll directly go to the hetero junction, we'll go through the top con, we'll go through the parasite. We will uh, be adopter of the latest, uh, newest technology and we don't have to go through that learning curve or making the mistake. So in some sense, it's a blessing also uh, uh, that we, uh, the world uh, invested and we learned at their cost and now we are uh, going to be large enough player to at least be able to supply for Indian market and maybe uh, some bit for Australia and US who are uh, very actively looking at uh, Indian market. Uh, so I don't think manufacturing would be a challenge. I think uh, the other thing which is working to India's advantage is the uh, rule of law. Uh, first time it's happening in the last six months that Chinese manufacturers are not honoring the contract. Uh, binding contract, even uh, the contracts where letter of credit has been opened. So that is actually having a very negative impact of uh, China as a reliable, honest uh, supplier across the world. And if that kind of trend continues, I think uh, uh, India, Vietnam, uh, Indonesia and a uh, few of us will benefit immensely. Uh, from that, uh, if we uh, honor the contract and if you provide the world quality product at the most competitive price. Yeah, good. Uh, Vinita, I have some more questions for this and this. And I think before I do that, let me just go back to uh, uh, Venkat. Uh, Venkat, I think this market model not supporting inclusive growth has been a very fiercely debated topic in India. The truth is that India's policymakers cutting across political parties have adopted the Western free market model. I think that's the de facto model that India pursues today at the macro and the micro level. So let's be honest about it, but that's what drives uh, the policymakers as well, cutting across party lines, right? So where do you see this uh, 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 coming from? Because the macro policy, the fundamental thing that we are all springing our frameworks from is coming from the same Western free market model, right? So uh, uh, how do you see that playing out? Well, uh, I don't, much as we may have this viewpoint on the limitations of market model, we also understand that that has, uh, we have still not found a replacement of that, a viable replacement of that. Uh, I do recall four or five years back on a Horasis panel discussion in, in uh, Liverpool, and I was surprised how the CEO of Heathrow Airport and the CEO of another UK bank uh, they were speaking about the limitations of the market model. And it came from two uh, large players in the market model. So let me let me also 
share that I just speak with a lot of my colleagues, even very senior decision makers in the market model proponents also believe that there are limitations. So there is good intention on every side, but we also understand that there's a limitation. But that being said, is that so realistic or is that so despondent situation? I don't think so. Because what's happening is technologies are changing, behaviors are changing. And let me explain this to you. The whole gig economy that we all talked about, uh, because the market model itself, when it becomes very efficient, for example, uh, if I remember the data points right, when Maruti Suzuki in India set up the first capacity about uh, to pr- produce about 100,000 cars a year, it probably needed uh, probably 40,000 employees in the factory. And three or four decades later, the similar capacity just required 7,000 employees. So we know that uh, even in India, where, where labor is, uh, employing labor is the more important necessity we can't avoid the fact that the manufacturing technologies will shift and you can't go back to data technologies. Now, the, what happens in the in the course is people will not get jobs, but there may be wealth available to the economy. You redeploy the wealth in different ways and therefore people start consuming in a different way. And for that consumption has to be provided by a new set of services. And that's exactly what is a gig economy. So way, there's what I call is an autocorrection. Uh, but then the point is, is the pace of autocorrection uh, uh, adequate to offset the ills of uh, disproportionate or inequitable growth? That's a big question mark. Uh, but that being said, I think uh, even without displacing the market model, staying within the market model, there may still be a lot of uh, room to get a better balance between sustainability and growth. And I kind of bring in five dimensions. I, I'm not sure whether I can, I'll be able to go into all the five dimensions. One is what I call as a behavior. Second is policy. Third is technology. Uh, and other two are operating models and strategic collaborations are the way in which we grow. And I'll give you a quick example on behavior. How do we consume? Um, you order a toothbrush from Amazon and uh, a two gram or a five gram uh, product will have probably uh, 15 times packaging and seven or eight layers of packaging. Uh, I'm talking of a US context, right? Uh, That's because it's affordable. Why are we doing it? We're doing it because we can do it. Simple as that. (laughs) And it is economically viable. So the market model is making it viable to have an unsustainable growth. Now, uh, the difficulty would be that if in, Everybody knows India, which is right now about four to five trillion dollar economy in two or three decades, it will become 20 or 25, whether we like it or not. Now, what we have to be very careful is we should not be growing in that same model. If we grow, U.S. is still 330 million people. If a billion and a half people grow at that way, world is going to be totally rigged. It will be very difficult to recover from that kind of impact. So I think that we need to be very, very careful about as to uh, are there still avenues within the market model? Frankly, if I have the ability to spend on waste to deliver a toothbrush, uh, I don't have to. I may have the ability, but I don't have to. So I think that behavior is something that we need to be very careful about, at least in India, as, especially as we are growing, number one. In terms of, uh, I would say, in terms of technology, I'll once again give you a, a, a very simple uh you know, uh, act that has already been uh, achieved in India, the LED bulbs. You know, in the last seven or eight years, I think bulk of India's incandescent lamps have been replaced by LED bulbs. That itself is a knockoff of 70 to 80% of the energy being consumed for by lighting loads. And I'm an electrical engineer myself. Now, frankly, that's a technology that was available around the world. That technology, when it was available to India, India moved very quickly and totally demolished a a way of living which is not serving the country. So as technology, and by the way, this technology is a product of market model itself. So there are ways in which the same market model comes back to help. It's just that we need to be more intentional in how we make sure the best of the market models are put into the growth. And that's where I bring in policy. Somebody has to actively manage growth. We cannot assume that the particular framework of growth has been established and that's going to be on auto run mode. What I believe India needs to do and which India has been doing is carefully, regularly, continuously calibrate the growth policy, growth frameworks by changing uh, the underlying operating conditions. Uh, The other thing that I would like to kind of, I will not be able to cover all the five points, I will quickly want to get into collaborations and why I believe collaboration is very important. For example, this whole mechanism through which we deliver goods and services. Uh, 
physical goods and services now we have technologies such as hyperloops now hyperloops for passenger transportation may be difficult but hyperloops for goods transportation is very viable now india did move ahead of the curve uh, compared to many other countries when we wanted to establish a sort of a hyperloop test uh, run between mumbai and pune and of course we ran into a bit of a problems but that being said there's a, something very interesting about india india is a large geography if india does something for its own self it already becomes at scale and when it does things at scale not because of any other country but for its own self certainly the same the same technologies will become economically viable for many other smaller countries around the region but then instead of waiting for that can i make it more intentional to explain i totally understand that many of these technologies are very intensive uh, because they need research they need investments they need time uh, some something very similar to vaccine uh, there was a time when vaccine required 15 years to develop and today we developed a vaccine in a year or two but that was because of international collaboration nobody collapsed the process it was just that multiple companies multiple institutions around the world shared information shared know how and they accelerated the process because it's a common problem for everyone and if we can replicate that same collaborative approach in the way we grow to be very intentional such that technology which may be asset intensive which can be cost intensive it can be time intensive and effort intensive if we bring in multiple set of countries multiple set of individuals corporations to uh, play in a collaborative way we might be able to obviate some of this ills of market model so that's that's what i i do feel that there, there is still a lot of place to play and i think all these things require very very strong leadership uh political leadership uh, business leadership is helpful but i think the more relevant leadership i am talking about is political leadership and a political leadership which the global leadership is willing to invest in it doesn't help if we have a great leader in india if the global leadership is not willing to and i think that's where india is doing some things very very right so i think uh, i absolutely feel thrilled about the intelligence of the common man on in, on the ground in india how they through their earthen logic still do the right thing and i think they did a great job all of us did a great job in uh, making sure there's a predictability in leadership But whatever may be anybody's politics there's predictability in that leadership and more important that leadership did a good job of making sure the global leadership is invested in it and i think that is the right condition that has been created for india at this point in time and and there's some very good people and i i i'm sure the country has lots of great talent and what's more important is that talent is now being deployed at different hierarchies in the decision making architecture so i think all in all uh, a good situation Uh, but is that situation going to deliver on its own no there are lots of pulls and pressures uh, so as i said we need to stay in control uh, we need to actively keep working on how we grow this economic engine so this is going to be a work progress for the next 20 or 25 years to say the least and uh, vinith i think uh, i'm just coming to you because before uh, ruben simply because yesterday when we were talking you spoke about how india is sustainable in its culture at the core how our old uh you know uh, ecosystem was thriving on uh, you know uh, materials around us so do you want to just build on that and then you know bring in other points that you spoke about yesterday so actually uh, uh, i feel and believe uh, i agree uh, with the parts of what uh, venkat was saying uh, i think india has uh, is uh, truly blessed that we have uh, such a deep uh, uh, know how and 1000 uh, year old culture which actually a lot of things which we are talking about probably our ancestors uh, already figured it out so in our culture what we do is uh, we worshiped all the natural uh, sources of energy uh, so we uh, put tulsi plant in every house which actually produces 20 hours of oxygen 4 hours of ozone and basically what it does it even converts the carbon monoxide in the houses into oxygen and carbon dioxide so Uh, we worship the uh, banyan tree and consider it equivalent to 10 kids and the reason was that uh, parents always used to love their kids so th- the thought process was that uh, once you start treating trees like your kids you will never reduce them and you will never cut it down so same thing if you look at water uh, the river ganges was called mother uh, uh, river and uh, our ancestors were not stupid to call water mother uh there was a rational logic it was uh, transversing through himalayas which uh, had lot of the medicinal uh, properties in the herbs and plants uh, uh, there and uh, and uh, water was, is a lifeline source so 
uh, similarly uh, in the morning everyone offers water to the sun you went mute when you you uh, you muted so it sun, so sun is actually if you look at uh, uh, every source of abundance in energy like you are talking about hydro you are talking about uh, uh, solar you are talking about wind those were all considered as the divine sources and uh, and society was taught and lived in coexistence with nature we uh, we build the full model of sustainability not only in terms of uh, the energy consumption but uh, the way we live uh, the way we uh, uh, consume even we had a concept of uh, not over indulging in eating habits we brought the world concept of breath which is uh, uh, fasting uh, and there were days defined based on the lunar movement uh, when the fasting gives the maximum impact to your intestine and why human intestine which is uh, much longer than the animal intestine the eating habit should be different so everything had some scientific base and learning of uh, thousands of year and i think that the time is uh, perfect now from world to learn from uh, india's experience and india also not to emulate uh, the west blindly like our uh, uh, venkat was saying that we have a uh, lot to learn from our own elders and our own culture and if we start respecting our own culture like when yoga was accepted by rest of the world we, each and every one of us started talking about it and now same thing is about intermittent fasting or uh, several other lifestyle i think what we need to do is look inward and see what we had learned and how do we replicate in a bigger scale across uh, the world i think the solution uh, lies uh, in taking right decisions on your transport infrastructure on your energy infrastructure which is almost 70% of your polluting source but 30% is on human consumptions and um, and the city waste and everything else uh, industrial waste which is generated so a uh, country needs to look at its uh, scientific uh, past it needs to look at uh, how do you strike the equilibrium between the energy need of the country economic growth requirement and environment unless we strike the balance in these uh, three e's i call uh, uh, we would be uh, irresponsible in some way because uh, 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 from a hinduism cultural context we have no right uh, uh, of uh, depriving our future generation uh, from something which our uh, uh, forefathers gave it to us so if we can't do good for them we can't do bad either so if we can't give them the best of the possible environment we should stop destroying the environment and uh, follow our uh, follow our uh, ancient learning and put it into daily practice and i think unless uh, humanity at large notices that uh, in their lifestyle in their behavior in their culture in their in the way they live i don't think uh, uh these targets can be fully met and uh, we are looking at uh, disaster in making and uh, earlier uh, we used to only hear about uh, these disasters happening in uh, uh, in uttarakhand or remote parts of india and remote parts of emerging economies but now we are hearing about new york city we are hearing about germany we are hearing about london so uh, forget about the next generation if we have to survive uh, uh, we, there is no other way except to live with nature and uh, and uh, continue to enjoy the blessing uh, and maintain that uh, sustainability approach in every walk of our life yeah ruben i think you were mentioning about how india needs to uh, relook at uh, some of the uh, current uh, uh, partners you were particularly mentioning iran and uh, uh, cng and uh, uh you know uh, uh, something like that so can you just elaborate on that you know uh, how does that help in balancing the uh, economic goals with the global goals yes uh, before going into that i wanted to comment uh, on what i just heard from uh, venkat and, and vinit uh, first of all uh, vinit uh, you are right uh, indian civilization and culture gave a model of uh, holistic and uh, 
uh, harmonious uh, uh, way of living. That's why, for example, yoga is so uh, popular all over the world. My son is adept of yoga. I used to be. Uh, so, of course, and that shows how to interact with the uh, environment which, within which human being is considered itself as a part of the whole. Uh, but having said that, on the good, uh, based on the good traditions, one could also uh, uh, reap the benefits of the new um, technologies of fourth industrial revolution, and that is very important. For example, and that gives means of uh, to uh, continue honoring the traditional approach. Um, uh, more sophisticated technological means. We are living now, uh, we are speaking from homes, so we don't have a, a big footprint of travel to India. Um, we at the same time uh, have Internet of Things, which per permits us to switch off the electricity when we are out. And we are uh, now considering how to construct less business buildings because we would, we would not need these business buildings. So uh, a combination of good ancient traditions uh, able to benefit from uh, new technologies of uh, fourth industrial revolution would, I think, be the solution. As far as the uh, market failures and uh, government failures are concerned, they both fail, that's true, but, uh, and uh, we are living in the world of uh, cooperation, and one of the uh, best economists, Colombian economists, whom I quote to my students, uh, Jagdish Bhagwati, uh, told that after the collapse of the WTO negotiations in Doha, uh, the world is living in a sort of a spaghetti bowl, in other words, all countries are having bilateral relations, and I'm coming uh, to your question about Iran, uh, free trade agreements, but uh, uh, World Trade Organization is sort of at a backstage, but we should not forget that it is thanks to World Trade Organization formerly GATT, we got Uruguay around, at that time I was working in uh, Anktat and Lakshmi Puri was a director of trade division, uh, uh, the world achieved lowering of import tariffs of ma unmanufactured goods. Uh, now uh, we are in, the, in between the protectionism and liberalization uh, and governments continue to uh, be, uh, while they, uh, there is a I, I spent my career in Ankta 30 years, so I was in an intergovernmental setup. But I knew that each government is responsible to its own people on its own territory. Okay, so the question is how to find an optimal solution between cooperation with other countries, but at the same time finding niches in the world economy for your national economy. And that brings these industrial policies which Vinit uh, mentioned. And you said yesterday that cost of capital in India is higher than in China. So what is the answer? Is the public-private uh, coordination on how to diminish that cost of capital, permitting Indian enterprises to produce competitively solar panels, for example. Now, coming to your question of uh, what India should do in terms of its energy security, because yes, it has to change its structure, but it doesn't uh, have enough uh, uh, oil and gas, which its economy will need. And for that, it has to develop strategic uh, relationship with the countries of Gulf uh, and one of the uh, closest sort of country, which is uh, uh, also a producer, a big producer of gas, is Iran. And uh, the uh, emerging market of uh, liquefied natural gas uh, which is now more and more competing with pipeline gas, uh, permits India to have more better access to gas. And gas in world energy transition is the transition energy source because we have hydrocarbons, coal, uh, coal uh, oil and gas, and we have renewables. But the cleanest hydrocarbon is gas, and it should become more and more important. 
And as a result, the relations um, of India with LNG uh, exporters, but also with uh, Central Asian countries uh, by uh, develop and, uh, for example, Turkmenistan is, is, is has pipelines to China. It can have a pipeline to India. Maybe it is under construction. So the combination of this active policies uh, outside to secure energy supply in a more sustainable way well, to meet the sustainable development goals and the industrial policies permitting structural changes in Indian economy, making it, for example, leading producers of solar panels for its own, first of all, consumption, but also for trade. Yeah, thanks, Ruben. I think we only have, I think, uh, four minutes and I think, uh, you know, we could have discussed RCP which India became part of and then pulled out at the last minute. I think there are a lot of these things that are there up there, and I think uh, we don't have the time. Uh, and I think there is this morning I was listening to a panel where Lanil Vikramasinghe, Vikramasinghe, who is the former prime minister of Sri Lanka, was on the panel, and they were talking about how India needs to also be a responsible, functional democracy for it to be uh, respected worldwide and for it to pull the weight of its economic uh, uh, status. So I think there are there are a lot of perspectives that we can discuss, but I think because it's just closing time and I think we hardly have a few minutes, what I thought I thought would be the best thing to do is to have each of you probably take just a minute to do your uh, closing uh, uh, remarks or summing up or whatever that you want to do in that minute. So uh, Venkat, over to you uh, uh, for your uh, closing remarks. Well, thank you so much, Xavier. Uh, I I just want to say that you no, know, in a let's say in a hundred year horizon, horizon changing this energy mix is not going to see us beyond 30 or 40 or maximum 50 years. So when we talk about sustainability versus economic growth, I think this agenda spans beyond 50, 60, 70 years. And therefore, at best, talking on optimizing the sources of energy is at best tactical. It may not even be strategic if we have to keep that as a horizon. I think the solution still re resides in how do we make sure. I'll bring a simple concept that we have in the financial world. There are three levers to wealth generation, earning, saving, and investing. And they say that saving and investing generates more wealth than earning. And I think that's where there may be a solution for India. How do we make sure we uh, optimize the energy footprint of consumption? I think the solution will lie there. Uh, sources of energy, hopefully technologies will find us some replacement of base energy, which is thermal energy. At this point, we do not have that solution. No country has a solution. But yeah. Uh, Vineet? Uh, uh, I think uh, what we need to do, uh, uh, I have benefited uh, greatly from a simple philosophy that what gets measured gets managed, gets delivered and uh, inspect what you expect. Uh, so just taking on from those two philosophies which we follow in business, uh, the world should actually start uh, reinstating their balance sheet. Uh, and in the balance sheet, we just mentioned EBITDA, PAT and uh, equity, etc. What we should also start doing is uh, start measuring uh, the social return on our investment and environmental return on investment. Once we start quantifying uh, the kind of uh, uh, good or bad we do for the environment and nature, uh, our awareness uh, will uh, start uh, igniting and I think uh, uh, wherever your energy flows, uh, you tend to uh, fix that problem. So I think in addition to what uh, UN and other world uh, con leaders are trying to do, I think we have to make these small changes, which is there on your face every day that even an employee who wants to join you and if he's socially conscious and environmental friendly and you are a polluting company, he may not join you. So I would say that uh, uh, through the Horasis platform, maybe we should uh, uh, encourage your world leaders uh, to look at that. those two numbers also being notified in every uh, company's uh, balance sheet so that uh, uh, people can choose who they want to work with, who they want to partner with, and who they want to buy the product from or who they want to sell the product to. Ruben, you. your final remarks? Yes, uh, my final remark as I am... Uh, sort of outsider, I would look into India as a key player in group of 20 uh, where uh, the main uh, challenges of world economy are discussed and with increasing uh, extreme climate events uh, and public opinion, 
the governments will be constrained to find a, a model of development whereby the uh, economic development is not compromised, but at the same time, the sustainability targets are more or less uh, respected. And that is uh, will be a, a combination of internal industrial policies and public-private partnership within the country and more active uh, cooperation of Indian government with uh, other uh, main uh, players, uh, governments in the world, so that they will come to a more cohesive approaches uh, together on different platforms. And I would uh, stress the importance of G20 platform because it is the 90-95% of the world economy. Yeah, thanks, uh, Ruben. Thanks, uh, Venkat. And thanks, Vineet. And I think uh, we've run on time. I think uh, I'm just clicking the groovy. I don't know how it comes out. I think I hope all of us can smile and see if it comes out well. But I don't know. I'm just trying it the first time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I hope it's come. So thanks all of you and I hope to stay in touch behind the panel. And uh, uh, I think I'm connected to Venkat and uh, Ruben already on the LinkedIn. And I think I just sent one to uh, Vinny. So let's stay in all touch and thanks so much. And lovely talking to all of you this afternoon. Take care and have a nice weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.